Okay, thank you. So I'm Lior. This is joint work with uh, Gil Segev, and I'm going to talk about uh, out of band authentication in group messaging. Oh. So we heard in the last couple of talks about uh, end to end encryption in uh, messaging applications. Uh, and note that uh, by now, if a pair of users has already established a shared secret key, then very roughly speaking, at least for the most part, uh, end to end encryption is kind of figured out, at least, at least in its most uh, basic form. So a key challenge is that of detecting many in the middle attacks when trying to set up secure end-to-end -end channels, right? What was referred to as a initialized uh, uh, part of the protocol in previous talks. Uh, so what do we mean by that? Let's uh, consider a concrete example. Let's say Alice and Bob want to t uh, chat for the first time over WhatsApp in an encrypted manner. So what they first have to do is they have to run some key exchange protocol. For example, they can run the Diffie Hellman protocol but unfortunately, it is very well known that the diffie hellman protocol becomes completely insecure when facing many the middle attacks when a many the middle attacker can simply change the values sent by the users with values of her own choice. More generally speaking, it's not hard to see that it is impossible to detect such many the middle attacks in any key exchange uh, protocol if we don't have any kind of setup such as a trusted PKI. And as it turns out, it is impractical to assume a trusted PKI in messaging applications due to their very ad hoc nature. So users have multiple devices, they replace the devices, update the contacts, etc. Fortunately, what is practical to assume, and what is indeed assumed by most messaging applications nowadays, is that the users have the ability to out-of-band authenticate one short value. So what do we mean by that? This is again the diffie hellman execution from before. After completing the execution, the execution the users can compare one short value that is displayed on both of their devices. So for example, this can be done if they're not physically together by having Alice record a voice message of herself uh, reading the value that she sees out loud, send it over to Bob, and then Bob can verify that the voice message that he received is indeed consistent with what he sees on his device. And assuming that Bob indeed recognizes Alice's voice, this forms a sort of a low bandwidth authenticated channel from Alice to Bob. Uh, so it is low bandwidth because Alice would only read so many digits out loud, and it is authenticated based on the assumption that it is harder to forge Alice's voice than a text message, at least in an online setting. Uh, so indeed, uh, this uh, kind of uh, model or a physical assumption or approach is used today not only by WhatsApp, but by most messaging applications that provide end-to-end uh, -end encryption. Uh, and it was also considered uh, for a while within the cryptographic community. So in 84, Rivest and Shamir introduced the interlock protocol, which also assumed that uh, the users recognize each other's voice. So this uh, already back then shed uh, some uh, important initial light on the potential and benefit uh, of uh, such uh, model or physical assumptions uh, to tasks uh, such as the one that we are considering. And indeed, some 20 years later, this was formalized by uh, this model was formalized by uh, Vaudenay in the computational setting and by uh, Nooratal in the statistical setting, considering bounded and unbounded adversaries, respectively. So let's talk about, a bit about the user-to-user -user setting. And to formalize this setting, it is helpful to think of uh, an equivalent problem to that of detecting man-in-the-middle attacks in key exchange, which is detecting man-in-the-middle attacks in message authentication. So what is this problem? Again, we have Alice, Bob, and the man in the middle. Now Alice wishes to send some message M over to Bob, who receives some possibly tempered with message M hat, and Bob wishes to detect with probability at least one minus epsilon whenever M hat is not M. Uh, so why this equivalent to uh, detecting man in the middle text and key exchange? So within the one direction, if the users have already shared a secret key, then Alice can just go ahead and uh, make the message. And in the other direction, it's not hard to see that uh, if the users have some uh, message authentication protocol, which is resilient to many in the middle attacks, then they can run any key exchange protocol and, just, and then just go ahead and apply the message authentication to the transcript of the protocol. So, okay, so what we did now was just to rephrase the problem, but it is still the case that uh, such a message authentication protocol cannot exist without any further assumptions. Uh, and this is where the uh, user's ability to uh, out-of-band authenticate one short value comes into the picture, and it is modeled as uh, an out-of-band uh, authenticated value, uh, authenticated channel over which Alice can authenticate one short L-bit value to Bob. And now we require that Bob will detect with probability at least one, one minus epsilon whenever M hat is not M, and now this might be a possible thing to ask for. 
Okay, so this begs the question of how uh, low bandwidth is this channel, or how, uh, how small is L? So in the case of WhatsApp or Signal, L is 240 bits. In the case of uh, Telegram, it's 288 bits. Uh, and more generally speaking, uh, Passini and Baudinet gave in uh, 06 a lower bound, showing that uh, L has to be at least log one over epsilon, right? So intuitively, if you want, say, 80 bits of security, L is has to out of an authenticate at least 80 bits. Okay, so a major goal in this model, as we uh, can see, is to get the best possible trade-off between L and Epsilon, right? Because we want the best possible security, uh, but we want to incur as little effort as possible on the side of the users. Okay, so in this user-to-user uh, -user setting, previous works have established a complete characterization of this trade-off. So we already mentioned the lower bound of Passini and Vaudenay. And indeed, a year prior to that, Vaudenay gave a matching protocol so in the computational setting, uh, these two results taken together show that in order to get security epsilon, log, log one over epsilon out of band authenticated bits are both necessary and sufficient. And in the statistical setting, Nora et al. showed that you have to work twice as hard. So they gave uh, protocol and the matching lower bound, showing that to get security epsilon against unbounded adversaries, one has to out of band authenticate two log one over epsilon uh, bits, and this is also sufficient. Okay, so the focus of this uh, work is the group setting. So whereas in the user-to-user -user setting, we mentioned that there is a complete characterization of the trade-off, and we also saw that there are uh, practical protocols in deployment by uh, messaging applications nowadays. This is far from being the uh, case in the group setting, and in particular, the protocols enabled by uh, today's messaging applications are far from being practical. Okay, so in this slide, our contributions are twofold. First, we put forth a framework for modeling out of band authentication in the group setting. This includes both the model of communication and notions of security. And I'll give more details about them both later on, but just to give you a sense right now, uh, let's, have so let's suppose that this is our group. Uh, assume for simplicity that it consists of a group administrator and uh, k additional users. Uh, so the users communicate uh, among themselves over some insecure channel over the which the adversary has complete control. And in addition, in addition, the group administrator has the ability to out of band authenticate one short value, which is then visible to all other users. Uh, based on our conversations with people in the industry, we gather that this is consistent with uh, current messaging platforms. For example, by having the group administer administrator record a voice message of herself reading uh, a short value that she sees out loud, send it over to the group, and then each group member can verify that indeed this voice message is consistent with what he sees on his device. Okay, so within this framework, we uh, provide tight bounds for uh, out-of-band authentication in the group setting. Uh, so let's consider groups of size k plus one, right? We have uh, k receivers or additional users. With the group administrator, we have a group of size k plus one. Uh, so we show that uh, in the computational setting, you don't have to work uh, quite as hard if you consider larger groups. So we give a protocol and the matching lower bound, showing that in order to get security epsilon, uh, log one over epsilon plus log k out of band authenticated bits are both necessary and sufficient. Uh, in the statistical setting, however, we show that you have to work much harder. Uh, so we give a lower bound, showing that the number of out of band authenticated bits has to be linearly dependent on the size of the group, right? Namely, uh, one has to out of band authenticate at least k plus one times log one over epsilon minus k bits in order to get security epsilon. And we also provide the matching protocol in which k plus one times log one over epsilon plus log k bits are out of band authenticated. And note that these two uh, terms indeed uh, match within an additive, an additive term, which is something like k times log k. But whenever k is much smaller than one over epsilon, which is your typical case in messaging applications, this becomes a much lower order term. And it is worth mentioning that our computationally secure protocol is quite efficient and practically relevant. It substantially improves <coughs> upon the currently deployed protocols. Uh, so just uh, to give you a sense, if you consider a group of, say, size uh, 33, and you want 80 bits of security, then using the currently enabled uh, protocols, you have to out of band authenticate over 2,700 bits, whereas using our protocols, you can do with just 85 bits. Okay, so the talk outline will be the following. Um, I'll uh, give some more detail about the communication model and notions of security. I'll introduce the naive protocol currently enabled. And then I'll uh, give some detail about our results. I won't have time to cover them all, so I'll talk about our computationally secure protocol. And as time permits, I will say a few words about our statistical lower bound. Okay, so the communication model. We already saw this uh, picture. Let's, uh, 
as we said before, we can uh, talk about message authentication. So let's replace the devices with S4 sender and R1 through our cable receivers. Uh, so, uh, as we said, uh, users communicate among themselves over an, an insecure channel, and the adversary is assumed to have complete control over this channel. So she can read messages, change them, delay them, insert new one, etc. Uh, and in addition, S has the ability to out-of-band authenticate one short value over an out-of-band channel. So this channel is assumed to be authenticated, but not secret. So the adversary can read messages, uh, delete them, delay them, etc., but she cannot modify them or insert new ones in an undetectable manner. So within this uh, model, we can define correctness and security. So let's be a bit more formal now. Let's give S some input message M, which is the message to be authenticated. And at the end of the protocol, each receiver outputs a message. Let's denote the output of RI by M hat I. And the correctness requirement states that in a non-stack execution, all receivers must output the correct message M. Right, let's say with probability one, so we had perfect correctness. Uh, as for security or unforgeability, we require that uh, the probability that there exists some receiver, Ri, that outputs a fraudulent message, right, meaning M hat I, which is not M, the correct message M, nor is it the unique bottom symbol implying rejection, is bounded by some predetermined parameter epsilon. And as in the user-to-user uh, -user setting, we consider two flavors of security. So we have a computational flavor and the statistical flavor, considering uh, bounded and unbounded adversaries respectively. And another technical difference is that in the computational setting, we allow the forgery probability to be bounded by epsilon plus some negligible function of the security parameter. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, protocol currently enabled. So you know, what's the most naive thing you can do if you have a user-to-user -user protocol, you can just uh, have S independently invoke it with each receiver. Right, so how does this look like? We have S and R1 through RK again. First, S invokes a user-to-user -user protocol pi with R1. Then it does so with R2, and so forth, until it does so with RK. But the problem with this, of course, is that now S has to out of band authenticate quite a long uh, value, right? Namely, it has to, to out of band authenticate at least K times log K over epsilon bits, okay? Where the K inside the epsilon simply comes to enable a union bound over receivers, so the, the forgery probability may be bounded by epsilon. Uh, and just, just to give you a sense, so we talked about the 33 users example. If you consider even larger group of, let's say, roughly 1,000 users, now S has to out of band authenticate more than 90,000 bits in order to get 80 bits of security. Right? So both of these examples seem rather impractical, but unfortunately, this is what you can do with today's messaging uh, platforms. Okay, so this leads us to our protocol. Uh, our protocol is based on a generalization of the NAS user to user protocol while addressing some uh, non-trivial technicalities and vulnerabilities that arise from trying to generalize it to the group setting. Uh, so I won't have the time to get into them, but uh, I'll just go ahead and uh, display our protocol. So let's consider just two receivers for simplicity of presentation here. And the protocol proceeds as follows. So the receivers first sample each uh, an LBIT random string, and each of them sends a commitment to this string to all other users in the protocol. Now, obviously, a commitment scheme might be interactive, but I'll just refer to uh, commitment schemes as messages uh, for now, and we'll bear in mind that everything I say readily extends to interactive commitments as well. In response, S uh, sends M, along with a commitment to M and a random L-bit string of his own, or S, at which point the receivers decommit to reveal the random values, S decommits to reveal RS, and finally, S out of band authenticates to the XOR of RS, R1, and R2. And each receiver accepts the message M that it uh, received as a second message of the protocol, if and only if this uh, out-of-band value is indeed consistent with what he expects to see, given the insecure communication. Okay, so here's a theorem. If the uh, commitment scheme used in our protocol is statistically binding and concurrent non-malleable, then for any K and L, it holds that the epsilon of this protocol is K times 2 to the minus L. Right, or in other words, for any efficient adversary, the forgery probability is bounded by k times 2 to the minus l plus some negligible function of the security parameter. So how do we go about proving this theorem? So we focus individually on each receiver, and we prove that the uh, probability that this receiver outputs a fraudulent message is bounded by 2 to the minus l plus some negligible function of the security parameter, and then the theorem follows by taking a union bound over all receivers. And to prove that, uh, we consider all possible synchronizations that the man in the middle might impose on, a, on an execution of the protocol relative to RI, 
and I'll talk about just one of them today because I won't have time to go talk about more, but this captures the gist of the proof. And then we reduce a successful attack in each of these uh, synchronizations into a contradiction of the, uh, one of the security properties of the underlying commitment scheme. Okay, so let's consider just one example. Let's say the adversary wants to make R1 output a fraudulent message, and it does so using the following uh, timing. So first, R1 uh, commits to uh, a random uh, string uh, little r1, then S receives commitments to uh, r1 hat and r2 hat, which might be the same as the real r1 and r2, they might be different. Then uh, S sends M and the commitment to M and RS, uh, followed by r1 receiving a commitment to r2 tilde, along with M, S, uh, M hat and the commitment to M hat and RS hat. Again, this R2 tilde and RS hat might be the same or different than other values sent uh, during the execution of the protocol. Okay, so let's for simplicity here non-uniformly fix the worst case R1, R1 hat, and R2 hat, right? Meaning the values that correspond to the maximal forgery probability by this adversary. And note that the attacker gets a commitment to M and some RS and outputs commitments to R2 tilde and to M hat and RS hat. And in order to be a successful adversary, two conditions must hold. So first, this linear relation listed in this slide might, might, must hold, right? Because in order for R1 to output something which is not bottom, the out-of-band value that S sends must be the same as the one that R1 is expecting to see. And in addition, M hat has to be different than M, right? Because otherwise this won't be a forgery. Uh, but the concurrent on malleability of the underlying commitment scheme tells us that the probability that these two conditions indeed hold simultaneously is bounded by two to the minus L plus some negligible function of the security property. All right, so this concludes the reduction for this uh, synchronization. And I won't have the time to get, uh, to give definitions of uh, concurrent non malleable commitments, but I will say that uh, from a theoretical point of view, a long line of work has taught us that uh, Constant round concurrent non malleable commitment schemes exist based on a minimal assumption that one way functions exist. And from a more uh, practical point of view, just the folklore commitment of hashing the, um, the value and the randomness in the random oracle model uh, gives us a, a non interactive, simple uh, scheme which is sufficient for our needs in our protocol. Okay, so I'll uh, have the time to say a few words about. Um, about our statistical lower bound. Uh, so uh, we saw this picture before. This is uh, an execution of some protocol that we want to attack. And let's denote by capital sigma the uh, random variable corresponding to the out of band value in a random execution of the protocol that we want to attack. Okay, so this sigma is a random variable and as such it might have some initial entropy but note that this entropy declines during the execution of the protocol since at the end of the protocol this value is fixed and sent, so it has no entropy. And the intuition uh, for a lower bound that can be found in the Naora tile paper for the user-to-user -user setting tells us that in order for the forgery probability to be bounded by epsilon, this decline in entropy must adhere to a very specific structure. Right, so namely, each party in the group or in the protocol must independently reduce, in some sense that will hopefully become clearer in a second, uh, at least log one over epsilon bits of entropy from age of sigma. And if you believe this intuition, then the lower bound follows by summing over all uh, users in the group, right? So we have that age of sigma is at least k plus one times log one over epsilon, and this is obviously a lower bound to the average length of the uh, out of band value as well. Okay, so to give some more details about our lower bound, I'll need to introduce some notation. Uh, so let's assume that it, uh, the protocol that we want to attack has T rounds of insecure communication, and it follows a very specific structure. And I'll describe this structure again just for two receivers, but it readily extends to uh, any number of receivers. So let's say that uh, the protocol proceeds as follows. S sends a message X0 to all other users, followed by R1 sending X1 to all other users, R2 sends X2 to all other users and so forth, X3, X4, and X5, until XT minus one. Uh, and given this notation, we can start to uh, understand the age of sigma, so we'll introduce a last bit of notation. Let's denote by capital M the random variable corresponding to the input message uh, M to S, 
and by capital X zero through capital X T minus one, the random variables corresponding to the messages sent by the parties during the execution of the protocol. And we already know capital C. So the main observation is that we can split age of sigma in some sense according to the marginal contribution of each round. So what do we mean by that? We can write age of sigma as age of sigma minus age of sigma condition on mnx0 plus age of sigma condition on mnx0, right? What we did now was just to subtract and add the conditional entropy, uh, entropy of sigma condition on the partial transcript up to uh, the first round and including the first one. And we can do that for uh, each round of insecure communication. But this now can be rewritten as the sum over all rounds of the mutual information of sigma and the current message in this round conditioned on the partial transcript of the protocol up to and not including this round. Right? This is by definition. So now what's inside the red rectangles can be thought of as the entropy reduction caused by S to age of sigma. Right? Because S is the one to send X0 and also the XJ is inside the sum and flips whatever random coins it has to to determine sigma when the insecure red transcript is fixed. And similarly, uh, what's inside the blue rectangle for every i can be thought of as the entropy reduction by ri. And now our uh, lower bound uh, is completed using two lemmas. So lemma one tells us that the forgery probability, uh, that there, is a, there exists uh, an attack that succeeds with probability at least two to the minus entropy reduction by uh, s. And similarly, uh, for any i, we have uh, an attack that succeeds with probability two to the minus entropy reduction by ri. Right, and then the lower bound follows. The success probabilities, the product of the success probabilities is at least two to the minus h of sigma, right, minus k that I will disregard. Uh, and the lower bound simply follows uh, by the epsilon uh, unforgeability of the uh, protocol. All right, thank you.